Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome presentation. We're going to be talking about peer programming, peer-to-peer -peer PowerShell, the ins and outs of pair programming. And shout out to our keynote speaker for highlighting the session. That was pretty sweet. Yeah, that wasn't nerve-wracking at all. <laughs> A little bit of extra pressure. Yeah. Uh, starting off, we want to thank our sponsors. Of course, without them, we wouldn't be here. This guy's even from one of them. Oh, PDQ, shout out, love them. Very cool. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. Yeah, so what's up? I'm Andrew Pla. I work for PDQ.com. I'm a content engineer, and I do the PowerShell podcast. If you've seen me around, some people with some t-shirts. Um, if you want a t-shirt, come up after. I have some left, but I'm joined with someone very special today. My name is Kevin Cephalu. I am the DevOps Engineering Manager for NetChex. It's an online HRM platform. And uh, I'm also, this past year, a certified Azure Administrator. Uh, not big into the social media stuff, but if you do want to find me, I'm on GitHub, LinkedIn, and if you 3D print at all, uh, I'm also on Thingiverse. I like do, that. Uh, have some I, uh, designs. Yeah, some, some designs on Thingiverse. 3D print extraordinaire. I know you said you're not active on socials. Andrew Plotek, I am a little bit active if you want to check it out, do some cool stuff there. The host of the PowerShell podcast. Yep, yep. All right. All right, time to get into it, right? So the goal of this session, uh, we were thinking about how do we kind of frame this, and the goal of this session was to give a prescriptive method that will work 100% of the time, all the time. For every single challenge and hurdle that you're going to run into, we have the one solution. Yep. Just kidding. <laughs> gotcha. You got them, dude. There is no such thing as a prescriptive method to pair programming. Everything that we're going to discuss today is something that you're going to want to take in, learn about, and then make it your own. Dealing with humans is difficult. It's a lot more difficult than software a lot of the time. Yep, so uh, working with someone, you know, make it your own process. There's a lot of nuance and flexibility there. Yeah. All right. So, what so our we... actual goals. Yeah. So first of all, we're going to give you an overview, explain kind of what pair programming is. Some of you may be a little bit familiar, but we'll contextualize things for you. Yep. We'll go over some general roles and styles that mm -hmm. are often used in pair programming. Benefits and opportunities. Ooh. Yeah. What are yeah. some of the benefits of this? You definitely want to get something out of it, and you will. Yep. Challenges and solutions. We're not just going to give you problems. We're also going to recommend some ways that you can work around them. Always going to run into challenges. And then some tool recommendations. How can you actually go about implementing some of the stuff and techniques that we covered today? Yeah. What are some tools you should use? That's it. There's a lot of them. So what is pair programming? At its core, it is when two engineers work on a single unit of work at the same time. Now that is putting it very simply, of course. Uh, one programmer will generally own the keyboard. They will write code. They will deal with the editor. Uh, the other one is going to navigate them, guide them, give them information that they've Googled uh, or researched to try and figure out where to go next. And that's the by the book definition. You'll see there's, there's some nuance to it. There's of some different course. ways that we can expand beyond that definition. Of course. So some ideal use cases. First off, complex tasks. Uh, it's oftentimes we find ourselves with something that is very nuanced. And uh, everyone's heard of the rubber ducky, I, I presume, right? Being able to talk through a problem generally helps us get to a solution. Uh, it works with another human, too, surprisingly. It's not just inanimate objects? Yeah. Wow, that's yep. amazing. Yeah. Speed up important tasks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's important things that need to be done, and you can help alleviate the pressure that is put onto one individual by distributing it through a couple. Um, there's other benefits that come along with that, but that is one. Absolutely. Bottlenecks and roadblocks. Uh, a lot of times you find yourself in the weeds. Uh, you're slowed down by something. You don't have permission to do something. Pull someone in, pair with them. They're going to have expertise, permissions, 
that might get you through roadblocks a lot faster. That's what I'm all about. Problem solving, oh sorry, problem solving and help, yes. So when it comes to solving problems, two heads are better than one. Yeah. Getting that outside perspective, very helpful. My personal favorite, training and onboarding. Uh, honestly, this is something that uh, we're trying to do at our company uh, more, uh, we're codifying this process we call train and help, where effectively our DevOps, SRE, ops guys are not really doing much anymore. We're more hopping on calls and navigating someone who is driving the changes that they needed all along. We're teaching them to fish instead of giving them that fish. And for me, I'm pretty passionate about this. One of my key takeaways that I'd like to see more in the community is pairing with someone who's less experienced, maybe more experienced if you're in that boat, and sharing knowledge through that and helping them get to the next level. We can have more people who are competent coders, more people writing modules, contributing to projects. That's sort of my huge takeaway. There's a lot of stuff you're gonna be able to take away and apply to work. Um, but there's also the community we have to think about, right? It's such a community-oriented organization or, or event like we're at now. Definitely worth oh, keeping yeah. in mind. It's funny you say that because the next one is knowledge oh sharing. Gosh, what a segue. I know. It goes really well with training and onboarding, of course. Uh, I went back and forth about splitting that one. But actually focusing in on educating for the purpose of education. Um, it's also really interesting that a lot of times you find yourself as the teacher learning something in the process. So Yeah, one of the best ways to learn is to teach. Really solidify that knowledge and make it more accessible to you in the future. Couldn't agree more. And finally, technical interviews. Uh, this is a really cool thing too. Uh, um, I think we've all been through an interview once or twice before, right? Have you ever had to code something or do some sort of work in the interview. Uh, it's really pairing. You're supposed to collaborate with that person, at least the technical interviews that I've been a part of. Uh, they're going to ask you questions in, in the same way that you would pair with a navigator. They're going to guide you, help you understand the problem they're asking you to solve, and then ask questions about your solution after the fact. So. Really cool idea. Ooh, Roles, Roles and styles. styles. So first one, driver navigator. We've already kind of spoken about that one. Uh, you're going to start off with the driver. This is the person that owns the keyboard, right? The person that's in VS Code, typing away, working on the PowerShell script. They're writing the code. They're writing the tests, followed up with the navigator. So this is going to be the person that is guiding the driver. They're uh, looking things up. They're suggesting uh, where to go next. They're helping you focus on the target. Very personally, very ADHD. And uh, the number of times that I need someone just in the background to say, hey, get out of the rabbit hole, come back to reality. I can really relate to that. One of the main ways I use pair programming, obviously to teach other people, but also uh, if someone asks me for help on a task, I will often pair with them and use their navigation to help accomplish whatever task it is because similar to you, a lot of roadblocks, a lot of stumbling things you can run into, having someone else there to keep you accountable and on track is super helpful. Agreed. And uh, of course, the authors of this presentation, Andrew and myself, nor the DevOps Collective, do not condone driving while typing on a keyboard. Just thought we'd say that. Take it away. Yeah, we got the ping pong approach. So as you can see, we got Pong, classic, shout out Atari and all that. But the ping pong approach is where you sort of take turns. One person writes the test, and then the other person satisfies the test. And you kind of ping pong back and forth um, and we always talk about, you know, we hear pester, test-driven development, getting mm -hmm. tests written. That is, uh, can be pretty daunting. I think some people struggle with that. But when you're able to yeah. distribute that workload, not have it all be on your shoulders, and sort of hold each other accountable, it, it can be a little bit easier. Yeah. And something important to note, too, is that, especially 
in ping pong, we're talking about role reversing as well. Same thing for driver navigator. Uh, just forgot to mention that you're often uh, changing roles. You're swapping back and forth. You're making sure that you're not over-reliant on one person doing one job, one person doing the other. So in the case of ping pong, uh, you're, one person's writing a test, the other person's satisfying it. The next test, that person now is writing a test and satisfying on the opposite side. Yep. So. Parallel programming. Whoa, fancy word. So this one's kind of cool. Uh, it feels on the surface very similar to how we normally work, right? Um, hey, I'll take this, you take that, we'll meet in the middle. But it, the focus here is on doing that collaboratively. Um, so say I take the get uh, commandlets, you take the sets, and uh, we're on a call together, we're asking each other questions, we're constantly integrating back because we're all doing source control, right? We're all committing mm -hmm. frequently. Yeah, good We're commit done, messages. Yeah. Uh, but that's really where your focus is here, is coordinating. You're getting that extra efficiency from you know, being flexible on time or, or maybe not wanting to talk the entire time. We were uh, kind of sort of doing that in preparation for this uh, summit. Yeah. And uh, Andrew turned on his music. He didn't realize it was on. Uh, and I could hear it, and I had Kylie Minogue stuck in my head the rest of the yeah. day. So, uh, but it's it's a really cool idea. It's very async. Uh, Discord's a great idea for it. You know, you can share screens, not really fully pay attention, but then focus in on integration. Yeah, and I think that the difference between your regular, so you have a regular work queue, a queue of work, whatever. You know, we're all kind of working on it. It's a bit more purposeful, more task oriented, project oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be projects that can take quite a long time and one person maybe was dedicated to that. You can sort of offload that by using some parallel programming to get some of the, the bulk of the work out of the way. Um, so yep. it's kind of a, another flexible application of pair programming outside of driver navigator. That's it. Whoa. And next is mob programming. Uh, so this is an offshoot from your, uh, your normal pair quote unquote, and now you're introducing a team of people. You still have that one driver, that one navigator, but then you have all of these other people in the room that are helping research things, giving their opinions and perspectives, and that navigator is then taking information that they've heard from the group and helping focus that driver based on what the room is saying. So I think people may be doing this and not really think of it in that terms, right? Like yeah. maybe we have an incident, we all hop on the call, one person shares screen. Anyone ever had a swarm call? If you deal with anything in production, all work goes out the window, you hop on that call and, and you're in there with five other engineers trying to figure out what happened. Mob programming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a really cool idea. And I, I feel like I don't see it uh, enough outside of that, oh crap, we need to do something. Uh, yeah. You know, something's wrong. If we can do this for any sort of project, something sufficiently complex, of course, it's not going to be like, hey, we're documenting this script. No, it's, it's going to need to involve a room full of people. But if you can capture their interest, this is a great idea. And I think thinking about it from this approach where it's like, okay, this is a thing we do. There might be improvements we can make to it. We don't just need to kind of freak out and panic. Like maybe as time goes forward, we can improve the way that we are collaborating and communicating. Great. There's also mixing skill levels. So this is more of a style, right? Um, you have, we'll start with your two experts pairing together. 
This is generally something that you see people do for very complex problems, uh, looking for uh, really intricate solutions, pushing the, the needle on things. And uh, the collective experience that you find between two experts in a, on a subject is going to show in your final product. Yeah, and I think there's a term, a phrase that comes to mind, which is iron sharpens iron. And there can be a lot of uh, beneficial aspects in terms of raising both people with maybe a more advanced perspective. We said expert, it's kind of a loaded term, but someone who's a bit more with it, you can learn a little bit more. And, and sometimes the takeaways you can have is a bit different than what you would get working with someone who's more of a beginner and kind of teaching the basics. Yep. Oh, that's the wrong button. So next one is expert novice. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So this one is going to be more educationally focused, right? Uh, generally, you'll find a lot of the knowledge sharing is flowing down to someone who is a little less experienced. But I, I do want to call out here is that just like we spoke about earlier, you'll find that you have the opportunity, if you're the expert in this situation, to learn things as well. You can sharpen your, uh, your fundamentals, or you might just learn something if you're open to it. And that, that's a, a key thing here, is always be open to learning something. If you're the expert in the room, you still have things to learn. Yeah, and I think establishing a culture of pairing where you are pairing on these different levels, it really eases the burden for those beginners to start upskilling. Because let's be honest, IT can be pretty daunting. There's a lot going on out there. And to, to get to that more intermediate advanced level, it can be very helpful to have someone sort of show you the way a little bit. Yep. Finally, we have the novice-novice pairing. So this is also very educationally focused, uh, but it's it's a little less daunting than just chucking a, a new person in the deep end and saying, figure it out. No, give them a buddy, have them pair together. Uh, they're going to help focus each other. They're going to work together to learn, to accomplish the task at hand. And at the end of the day, they're going to come out with not only the hard skills, but the soft skills as well. Yeah, and I think a big one for me is support right? You have that support and accountability of having someone else there to sanity check and you don't feel like you're having to perform beyond where your skills are because you're working with someone who's maybe you look up to them a lot. You sort of get someone on your same level where you can grow together. Yeah. And again, with the community thing, right? That's sort of the, the foundations of some of these relationships and, and things you can take with you throughout your career. Couldn't agree more. Benefits and opportunities. Ooh, how can we, we take advantage this one? of all this? Yes, so there's risk right. mitigation, right? So when you have a, a single point of failure, um, that could be in terms of someone writing one bit of code or a single point of failure, you have only one person who knows how to write PowerShell code and actually uh, maintain what you may have in your environment in terms of automation. Uh, when, when two people work together, they can resolve blockers, provide perspective, and hopefully avoid making some bad decisions that could hurt things. Uh, in, a in a major way and spread out some of that stress. Yeah. Faster, save more time up front. It's a really cool idea. So diverse perspectives. Uh, this is something that, you know, I, I think is kind of obvious on the surface, but we all have different experience. We're all coming from a different place. Uh, there might be similarities, but someone is going to catch something that you wouldn't think of. And that is the key here, is being open to that perspective, uh, being ready for it, expecting it. If you're just in a sounding board with someone who's going to always agree with you, what was the point? Uh, this way, you know, getting someone in the room, pairing with someone that is going to come up with different ideas is only going to make the solution better. And I think that 
to apply this pair programming thing, you really have to have an understanding that the diverse perspectives is actually really helpful. Um, yeah, in the context of pair programming and working on stuff, but just in general, to have more outlooks on different ways to solve a problem is better. And if you are connected to that, it'll serve you well in your pairing programs, uh, when you're pair programming, and people have a different perspective and you need to communicate a little bit about it. You gotta understand that sometimes we will not see everything perfectly. I know we're all smart, but it's good to be open. That's it. Yeah, ownership and consistency. So you now, the consistency plays into the fact that, okay, you got two people here. Maybe you have code standards at work. That'd be great. If you don't, at the very least, you have someone uh, looking at the code with you. And just that being together thing for me and for many, it, it adds some accountability. Kind of like how people uh, who work out in a gym usually work out a little bit harder than when they're uh, on their own, at least for me. That's definitely that's, true. That's a good point. Yeah. I'd and the ownership piece of this too is something very near and dear to my heart. Has, has anyone in this room ever gotten stuck owning something that they didn't want to deal with any longer? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that is, that is something that we've all shared and uh, having that extra person and then further and further down the road, they're teaching other people how to do this and own it. The consistency, of course, helps here, too, to make it more maintainable, readable for someone who wasn't involved in the pairing. So uh, this gets things out of your hands, out of an individual's hands, and into the broader scope of the team. Reduce technical debt. Reducing technical debt? No one here has technical debt, right? No, no. no. Just that bit of code I wrote recently. Yeah. No, this is, this is really cool too. And along those same lines is uh, being able to catch things up front that might lead to technical debt down the road. I mean, anything you write today will eventually, if not tomorrow, be technical debt. Uh, entropy, I believe, states that, that part of physics that we haven't discovered yet. I'll say one thing, not written, but an extra slide that just kind of came to me. Force multiplication. Right, So you have some impact you can make at an org, and it's kind of limited to the hours in the day, unless you're able to expand your efforts outside of yourself. And when you pair with someone and you share code standards and you bring them up, all of a sudden these skills that you've worked and now shared with others, you're able to have a much larger impact. Yeah. And as someone who's efficiency-minded, and I like that part of PowerShell a lot, it, it's really easy to think like, okay, yeah, building up people on my team is going to be massively worth it from an automation perspective long-term. Agreed. And if the person you're pairing with can't read the script, then what hope does a junior coming in and right. trying to figure it out down the road? So this is pretty cool. It'll help you up front. Uh, all right. Ta-da, it's fun, right? We're That's working. a benefit, right? We, I mean, we don't wanna just work. We wanna have fun doing it. We wanna get to know people. I know I have had a blast pair programming with oh, yeah. you uh, and working on the side deck together. We have learned a lot together. So fun is part of it. Otherwise, what's the point? Have fun, make money while you're having fun, learn new skills. I'm in, man, you sold me. That's it. Challenges and solutions. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, huh? But what's that? It's not all sunshine and rainbows. It is not, yeah. unfortunately, Dang. again. Humans are difficult. So differing work styles. Just like there's different perspectives, everybody has their own styles of working. Uh, you might use tabs, I use spaces. We're not gonna get along, right? Meet in the middle. <laughs> there is meeting in the middle, of course. Up front, decide how you're going to work. Come to some sort of agreement that says, Here's the times, here's what we're going to focus on, here's how we're going to do it, uh, here's the tools we're going to use to do it. If you get that out of the way up front, you're gonna have a better time. Be flexible. Yep. All right. Communication barriers. Yeah. Words are hard, uh, especially if you don't speak yeah. the same language as someone else. Yeah. Right, that's one obviously a really challenging thing you might find. <laughs> and I probably don't encourage pairing if you're not speaking the same language. Um, it, it might be challenging. But 
There's also different communication styles and personality types and a lot of other sort of complexities that time can present zones. some barriers. Time zones, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no one size fits all Band-Aid for this challenge. Um, but I think that one that's very helpful to be is curious, be eager, uh, be communicative. Active listening is a huge part. You got to be flexible if someone expresses sort of where they're coming from. Uh, you can't just be fixed in your own way Agreed. forever. So uh, unbalanced workloads, you're not going to want to uh, be overly reliant on someone. Has anyone had a, a project in like grade school where you were the only person that did the work? <laughs> Everyone else went off and, you know, had parties or whatever popular kids do. And, and then you were stuck at home making a PowerPoint. That's not going to be conducive. One, you're not going to get all of those nice benefits that we just chatted about. But two, you're going to feel bad about the process. You're not going to want to pair with these people anymore. Uh, same goes in reverse. You know, if they're feeling like they're not participating and you're not giving them the opportunity to, if you're just dominating the entire process. We talked about expert and novice pairings. If you're just dominating the whole thing and you're like, here, watch me do it, and you never explain anything, you don't answer questions, you don't let them get their hands dirty, you know, it's, it's right. not going to be as beneficial as it could be. And just in general, it's not a brain dump situation, right? People here may be pretty technical. We want to mm -hmm. make sure that we are not just dumping all of our knowledge, getting lost in the excitement of this technology we love so much. It's a two-way street. We want to be communicating both ways, asking if they understand it or how would they do things differently. You know, Be active, in, in, especially if you're the more advanced person, be active in getting them to communicate as well because it's very easy to get intimidated and shut down. Really cool idea. We spoke about the role reversals, You know, swapping regularly. Set a timer. Uh, we didn't investigate it fully, but there was actually a VS Code yeah. extension uh, for mob programming that gave a timer that would assist with swapping the driver around. So, kind of a cool idea. Dealing with fatigue. I get tired. Coding is hard. Words are hard. I'm like tired doing right both now. of those, I am too. We're getting there. <laughs> But doing both at the same time is, it might be tiring. You know, life is complex. We have a lot of variables. We don't know everything about everyone else's life. Sometimes your resources that you have can be a little bit constrained. Uh, one way to mitigate that is to take regular breaks. Mm -hmm. Also be kind to yourself, be kind to the person you're pairing with. And uh, with all of these pairing things, one thing you want to have is not have it be a bad experience for the other person. And that means if you are burnt out, if it's not working for you, if you got a stressful text and it's okay to say, hey, today's not the day, can't do it, some stuff came up, because we don't want to have a situation where we get a little too frustrated, a little too pressured by our work, that we end up creating a bad experience for the other person. Maybe we're rude, maybe we just don't listen well. It's okay to take breaks, but also to step away. And to take those breaks before you need them. Yeah. Right? If you're going, to, uh, going into a break already mentally exhausted, you probably should have taken that break a half hour. All right, handling disagreements. No one in here has also had any disagreements with their coworkers, right? Just our managers. Oh. No, coworkers. I don't have my tag on. Are you saying something? Oh, I forgot, Mr. Manager. Ah. No, it's, it's important to handle disagreements. You're going to have them with that differing perspective, the differing skill levels, the different uh, knowledge that is coming into a pair programming session. There's bound to be disagreements. Uh, how do you handle them? Of course, like Andrew said before, be kind. Uh, you want to actively listen to the person that you're pairing with. You want to understand their perspective and why they are disagreeing with you or you're disagreeing with them. Uh, that communication is really important to being flexible and working through a disagreement. Uh, there will be compromise. You might not like the solution that you inevitably go with, but 
that's part of compromise. And understanding that you're both in to solve the same problem. Yep. No one's in there. They let, I don't forget the card game where there's somebody in the room who's a secret spy and you're Werewolf. trying to find them and yeah. they're derailing the process. If you're pairing with someone like that, run. Take a break, leave them with the check. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, you will encounter disagreements. It's okay. Move through it, compromise, and move on. And, and take note of whatever decision you made, maybe briefly summarize the different arguments and the kind of trade-offs of each decision. Because in the future, if you have to reassess the situation or whatever, it's great to have that context of the time you spend communicating about mm -hmm. it, right? We're just practicing these communication skills. Yeah, maybe the solution doesn't work out in the long run and you were right. You don't want that information to go back and say, ha ha ha. No, you want your next uh, move to be made for you. You know where to go. There's already another so, uh, solution on the table. Let's try that now. And oftentimes when you work through disagreements, if you can do it in a, in a kind, nice way, oftentimes the relationship you have with that person is going to be improved long term. And as you keep building and refining these skills, you sort of start to maybe change the culture of the team you work on. Um, you know, it can extend beyond just the one little thing you're pairing on, which is what I really enjoy about this. I disagree with you. That's all right. <laughs> We're different, that's all right. Uh, next thing up is a code of conduct. Uh, we spoke about it more in the informal sense, but if you're new to pair programming or you're joining in with someone who is new or mob programming, you might find it necessary to maybe have some sort of more formalized codified agreement that you're all coming into this you're going to be kind, you're going to actively listen, you're going to participate. And uh, we did put up just an example code of conduct on a, a GitHub gist. I mean, use it, tear it apart, make it your own, or don't use it. It's not necessary to have something written down. Sometimes it's just kind of nice to fall back on that. I think so too. I think one that is probably the most helpful to have written down is to speak to the communication that's expected in a pair programming session and some of those things. You know, depending on your culture, if you don't have kind of a, a nice culture where people are collaborating and communicating well and value that, it can be pretty helpful to have some guidelines going into it, even if it's just a message to teams or whatever you're using that says, hey, interested in pair programming, here are some of the things we're shooting for. And go from there. Yeah. I, I really like the community idea for this too. Yeah. You know, at coming into it, someone you don't know, you've never spoken to outside of the context of, hey, do you want to pair with me? This is maybe something to get started. You don't have to use it, but you know, hey, here's the idea I had and here's what I'm going to try and strive to abide by. Tools and configuration. We, got tools. we all like tools, right? We like, I like programs, PowerShell. utilities. PowerShell is my favorite, yeah. It's funny you say that. Oh my gosh, is it? You had this on the slide deck? Gosh, man. I mean, it's a PowerShell conference, right? You yes. Uh, some key points here you know, make sure that you're using the same version PowerShell. Uh, you have the same versions of dependencies, you know, if it's a, a module, a NuGet package, something. Um, make sure you're, you're paired up and uh, ready to go on both sides. Yep. You don't want to find out that they've been telling you to do something and you can't figure out why it's not working on your machine and you're just six versions behind. Yeah. So. And... Y'all ever heard of this? Oh, this is sick. No, no. It's a starting point. VS it's, Code is sweet. It's, it's this new little application called VS Code, right? You may have hold, heard of its older brother, Visual Studio. This is code. VS Code <laughs> um, has a lot of extensions that are pretty sick too. They are very sick. In fact, when you and I were pair programming, you might remember using this guy here, Live Share. It's pretty cool. The fact that, uh, it, actually, has anyone used like Word or uh, PowerPoint 
excel with someone else in the same tenant or, or you share yeah, you a see one all drive cursors file. all around the different colors yeah. yeah you're in a miro board cursors are flying everywhere you can't figure out what's happening you could do that in vs code too <laughs> who'd have thought uh, actually i mentioned earlier that mob timer uh, we again didn't really investigate it fully but it's a really neat concept it actually works with live share so everyone is seeing the same timer. They're being added to the pool for rotation. Um, and actually, we had some problems with live share. You're a Mac guy on yeah. Windows. It kept crashing your computer. <laughs> hey, you know, it's so, not all uh, sunshine and roses, right? Uh, yes. I mean, something to point out, too, is that VS Code.dev, this is how we got around yeah. it. Super cool, yeah, you can remote, one person can be using Visual Studio Code in the browser, on the interwebs, right, no VS Code requirement. Super helpful if you're kind of doing some impromptu stuff or dealing with someone who maybe hasn't gone through, they're a pretty beginner, they haven't gone through the whole PowerShell setup thing. You're able to share uh, access to a coding space that you can work on together and show them some cool stuff and then get them set up on VS Code afterwards. Exactly. Show them how cool it is and then get it. I wanna use a Raspberry Pi next time. <laughs> And then, of course, we talked about source control, but again, everyone's committing frequently, right? Yes. I will say also with the commits, if you are pair programming with someone, it can be very helpful to sign the commits, both of you, right? Because yeah. ordinarily to just show the one email, the person's machine that you're working off of. But uh, when you come back to that commit that maybe there was a decision made on or whatever, helpful to see the actual people who are involved in case one moves on. I don't think you, uh, we actually discussed this when we were pair programming, but uh, VS Code had uh, a pane that allowed me to add a co, uh, co committer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you say you'd have to have a strong commit to the coding relationship? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was asked if, uh, yeah, I was, I was asked if you needed to have strong commitment to source control. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Um, nor should you be. It's a good one. Uh, and of course, you know, you have GitHub, you have Azure DevOps, a myriad of options. Do it. It's a good idea. I don't care where it is. Source control. It's important. Communication platforms. There's a lot of them. Honestly, use whatever you have access to now. Um, on the community side, Discord's pretty accessible. A lot of people have it, uh, but at work, probably just use the tools you have. You can look to implement VS Code Live Share if that's something you can get in your environment as well. But often to get started, it's kind of helpful to meet people where they are. Um, so you have whatever and all that stuff. But also, there's a new technology I've heard of. I've been a remote worker for a while, but apparently you can actually sit next to somebody in person and pair program. Yes, <laughs> yes, you actually can. And I'll even say this. I don't think I it don't, is. No, not that. No, certainly not. You can't sit with your twin brother and share the same no. keyboard. But what you could do is, well, you have to kind of decide. Are you going to share a keyboard? You know, what is the physical interaction level that you're interested in? What do you have access to at your office or the coffee shop? Um, I recommend if you are going to share one workspace, Probably bring your own mouse and keyboard and kind of whenever you switch. You're not touching switch. my keyboard. Yeah, no, I'd recommend do, using your own computer, uh, especially these days. Use your own VS Code and all that, your own settings. But yeah, uh, Discord's actually something near and dear to my heart too, especially after uh, work from home started. I know me and my team, we, we got pretty depressed that we weren't able to just lean over a cubicle and say, hey, uh, help me out. Hey, you missed a semicolon. You know, uh, we struggled with, we had Zoom, we had Teams, and it was okay, but then we started trying out Discord. Voice channels that we were in all day, multi-screen sharing, the ability, it was, it was the closest thing that we could come up to actually being in the office with someone again. And it really turned things around for us. So this is something that I, I truly am passionate about. In fact, to the point where uh, our company is actually trying to implement a company-wide server now. So.
Are there any community discords you would suggest? aka.ms slash PS Discord, PowerShell Discord. Tons of awesome people on there. That's sort of the go-to, I mean, I'd say, starting point. They have, they have like a dozen people in there or something, right? A dozen million. <laughs> Two billion sessions a month. There's a couple it's, in there. It's a really great community. Um, the Azure one as well. Um, I mean, everybody's got a Discord server now. I, the number of times that I'm just stumbling through something randomly and I find a really cool GitHub project, they're on Discord. Yep. I want to learn Autogen for AI. Discord. There you go. A lot of communities there. Yep. One more consideration though with the video thing is camera on versus camera off. People have different comfort levels. If someone's uncomfortable with being on camera, totally fine. I do recommend checking out some of those little avatar thingies you can do so at least you get the physical interaction of seeing the person. Oh, they're looking around. They're working just like I am. Um, but that is a choice to make. I think it's helpful to be able to see nonverbal cues from people, right? You can tell, wow, am I ranting too much because they look so bored and like they haven't said anything in two minutes. Just kind of a different communication channel, nonverbal communication. I look up to that Discord monitor and I see Andrew just passed out. <laughs> Hey, is that a real story? No, no, maybe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I have a recording of it. And with that, thank you very much. Yes, thank you all so much. <laughs>